Welcome to the GW Ethics and Publishing Conference. We'll begin in about one more minute. Let's give everybody just a minute to log in. I know there's several people already here. Thank you. Welcome everyone to the 10th GW Ethics and Publishing Conference. Thank you all for joining us for this virtual conference. We will begin with a land acknowledgement. Although this is a virtual conference, all of us are situated in lands that were once the historical homelands of indigenous and Aboriginal people. Please take a moment to consider the indigenous people who once made their homes and communities where you are. The George Washington University's Foggy Bottom Campus in downtown Washington, DC, borders the confluence of the Anacostia and Potomac Rivers, a historical center of trade and cultural exchange between several tribal nations. For generations, the Piscataue and Anacostian peoples have resided in this region and served as stewards of the local land and waterways. Their people continue to thrive in the region and still honor and celebrate their culture and relationship with this land. We're fortunate that one of our conf conference presenters, Dr. Elizabeth Rule, director of the AT&T Center for Indigenous Politics and Policy at the George Washington University, will be speaking tomorrow about her work in developing the app Indigenous Guide to DC. Thanks to the College of Professional Studies at the George Washington University for its support of this conference, as well as the tremendous support CPS gives to the Master of Professional Studies in Publishing Program. A special thank you to our conference sponsors, the Association of University Presses, the Society for Scholarly Publishing, and the Association of American Publishers. Members or staff of all three of these at this conference. There are too many people to thank for their help in organizing and presenting this conference. And I'm probably omitting some inadvertently, but I would especially like to thank our conference co-organizer, Pooja Telekicherla, Licensing and Subsidiary Rights Manager at the American Psychiatric Association Publishing and Adjunct Professor, Master of Professional Studies in Publishing Program, George Washington University. At the College of Professional Studies, Acting Dean Melissa Foyer, as well as Kimber Moeller, Joanna Galt, Melanie Jonas, Nicole Mintz, Adele Ashkar, and Chris Deering. CPS marketing and recruitment staff provided a lot of support, including Amanda Gillespie, Gina DeAngelo, Dova Wilson, Lucero Flores, and Cheryl Scott Muzon. I would also like to acknowledge my dear CPS colleague, Jack Prosco, who passed away last month for all his support of the publishing program. For those of you who are on Twitter, and I expect that's pretty much everyone since the publishing community, community is very Twitter-esque, please use the hashtag ethics in publishing. I want to thank and acknowledge the talented students and wonderful faculty of the Master of Professional Studies in Publishing program at the George Washington University. I'm excited that we have seven alumni and one current student of GW's publishing program among our presenters at this ethics in publishing conference. I have served as director and associate professor of the publishing program for just over two years and served as adjunct professor for several years before that. This is the 10th edition of the GW Ethics and Publishing Conference. The program's previous director, Arnie Grossblatt, 
organized the conference until its last edition in 2016. Many or most of those were co-organized by our colleague, Michael Jensen. The MPS and publishing program prepares students for leadership roles in trade, scholarly, academic, education, and children's publishing, indeed across all publishing industry segments and specialties, including many students who launched their own publishing businesses. Launched in 2006, it became an online program in 2012. Students take coursework from professional publishers in editorial, acquisitions, copyright law, permissions, marketing, production, global business and management, children's media, design, and digital technology. Our faculty are truly publishing leaders across diverse fields and expertise, and include professors such as Dean Smith, director of Duke University Press, Al Bertrand, director of Georgetown University Press, Eric Slater, senior attorney at the American Chemical Society, and Josephine Ciortino from Canadian Science Publishing, who is presenting at this conference on Friday and is one of our alumni and now a professor in the program. And one of our outstanding alumni, Randy Townsend, also speaking at this conference and serving as moderator, will serve as the inaugural editor-in-chief of our GW Journal of Ethics and Publishing. This is a new journal managed by students in the publishing program that we will be publishing on the Manifold platform developed by our friends at the University of Minnesota Press. The journal will publish papers on many topics of publishing ethics, including diversity, equity, and accessibility, and will provide our publishing students with hands-on experience in editing and peer review. Please see the call for papers and join in congratulating Randy Townsend, who will also become one of our adjunct faculty members. I hope you will join us for many or all of our conference sessions over the next three afternoons. Video of the sessions will also be available after the conference. Here's a glimpse at today's schedule. Please join us tomorrow and Friday when our schedule is likewise filled with important and thought-provoking presentations on equity, diversity, and accessibility in publishing. And please join us when we conclude the conference on Friday afternoon for a networking opportunity and informal happy hour at 4 p.m. Eastern time. This will be at a separate link, which you can see here. You'll receive your conference email invitation. Thank you all for attending the conference and for your support. Please feel free to contact me with your thoughts about this conference or interest in the publishing program at GW. And now I'm thrilled to introduce our two plenary speakers, both of whom I've known and admired for many years. Peter Burkery has served as the executive director of the Association of University Presses since early 2013. Berkeley came to AU Presses, then AAUP, from Oxford University Press, where he served for the previous five years as vice president and publisher for the U.S. Law Division. Prior to that, he worked for Walters Kluwer and Thomas Reuters. Berkeley has extensive experience in government affairs and association management. He has served at the National Society of Accountants, the National Paint and Coatings Association, the American Trucking Association, and the Accreditation Council for Accountancy and Taxation. Peter has a BA in Classical Studies from Boston College and both an MA and JD from the American University, as well as a Master of Laws in Taxation from the George Washington University. He has been admitted to practice in Maryland, the District of Columbia, Hawaii, and the United States Tax Court and is a certified financial planner. Barbara Klein Pope is the director of the Johns Hopkins University Press, the nation's oldest academic press. Previously, she was executive director of the National Academies Press, steering its traditional print model through an era of digital innovation, including pioneering experiments with open access. 
She first joined the publishing division of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine in a marketing role in 1983. She has served as president and board member of the board of directors of the Association of University Presses and served on the management board of the MIT Press. She earned her bachelor's degree from the Indiana University of Pennsylvania and her master's from the University of Maryland. I'm first going to turn this over to Peter and then to Barbara, and we will have time to answer your questions. So please put your questions in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Hi, John. Uh, I trust I'm live at this point. Uh, let's see. I'd like to uh, introduce myself again. I'm Peter Berkery. I have the privilege to serve as the executive director of the Association of University Presses. My pronouns are he and him, and uh, I'm speaking to you today from land that is the traditional and ancestral home of the Miccosaukee and Seminole people. Uh, John, I really appreciate the opportunity to invite uh, to speak today uh, and uh, to address uh, this topic. I'd like to start by putting some context uh, around what the ethical imperative of the university press uh, actually means. In uh, a number of material ways, university presses are not like other publishers. Uh, we'd like to think of our, that one of those ways is that we hold a unique relationship uh, to the ethical implications of our actions. And there's a number of reasons for that, uh, uh, which uh, I'll explore uh, over the next 20 or so minutes. So to tell you a bit about what I hope to cover today, first, uh, I'd like to share a little bit of background about our community uh, and uh, our association. Then, uh, for a bit of necessary context, uh, how we've engaged with the strategic planning process uh, because as part of that process, we first identified uh, and then iteratively defined uh, our community's uh, four core values. I'll talk a bit about a little bit about how various ethical imperatives uh, inform these values, how we've come to view them through a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens, and uh, also uh, share some examples of how we're trying to put them in action. Uh, at both the uh, organizational and individual member press level. So first, uh, the association at a glance. AU Presses has 154 members in 17 countries, uh, probably important for today's discussion. A hundred of those are supported by US colleges and universities. Collectively, we published 12,000 books and 1,500 journals last year. And cumulatively, we have a joint 330,000 titles in print. I think it's probably also helpful to keep in mind that uh, uh, we maintain uh, fairly rigid criteria uh, in order to be eligible for membership. These uh, relate to nonprofit status, to uh, editorial rigor, uh, and to what we like to call a sustained commitment to publishing, which is having a critical mass of staff, having a critical mass of output, having a critical uh, a level of administrative support or uh, uh, institutional support, I should say. Uh, our work is governed by a 13 member board of directors and uh, uh, gets done by uh, 22 amazingly dedicated committees and task forces uh, supported by uh, uh, seven dedicated staffers in our central office. So now that you know just a little bit about our demographics, I think it's important to understand that we are fundamentally uh, a, a community. And so as a community, we're in relationship with a number of constituencies, first and foremost, each other. That is the staff at, uh, at uh, the individual member presses and our colleagues. Uh, while uh, membership in the association is uh, institutional, it's people who do the work and people who make the community. Uh, we, of course, also are each in relationship with our home institutions, with our authors, with the scholars, students, and general readers who use our products, with numerous service providers from corporations all the way down to freelancers, 
uh, and uh, also with uh, uh, other associations and scholarly groups representing, for example, uh, humanities advocacy or other uh, constituencies in the academy. And of course, uh, with the, uh, the journalists and the book reviewers uh, who help us tell our story. It's against that background and against uh, th those relationships that we set out almost six years ago now to fundamentally reconsider our identity, uh, our goals as a community, and to create for ourselves a new strategic plan. Now, there's, <clears throat> excuse me, there's no one right way to craft a strategic plan, but all good strategic plans uh, include a mission statement. So the Association of University Presses advances the essential role of a global community of publishers whose mission is to ensure academic excellence and cultivate knowledge. And uh, I can assure you that uh, every word in that sentence was deliberated uh, and each is freighted with specific meaning. So another critical component, component of any strategic plan is goals. And uh, uh, when we first uh, reinvented our strategic plan in 2014, we articulated five goals, uh, advocacy, collaboration, research, education, and infrastructure. Just a quick word about two of those. Uh, advocacy, when someone from an association uses the word advocacy, uh, most folks, especially in the Washington DC area, tend to think of uh, government affairs and uh, maybe even lobbying. And while a little bit of that kind of advocacy work occurs, what we as a community mean by advocacy is advancing a, a, our value proposition, the understanding of the university press value proposition among key constituencies, especially the administrations uh, that fund us. Um, also, just a quick word about infrastructure. Uh, when we uh, uh, created our plan in 2014, uh, we realized that a lot of the infrastructure that was going to be necessary to execute on it, the software tools, the technologies uh, that would be essential to success simply weren't in place. So uh, we, we made uh, uh, infrastructure uh, a strategic goal. Uh, when we revisited the plan in 2019, we actually retired that goal because we felt that we had accomplished most of the work that we had set out. And I think it's important to highlight that, not so much because infrastructure is overly germane to the topic, as it is to just remind ourselves that a strategic plan is a living document. It's not kind of a one and done, you print it out, put it in a binder and throw it up on a bookshelf. It, it, you, have to, you have to live it, you have to revisit it, and uh, you have to keep it fresh. So um, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's the goals in our strategic plan. Uh, our plan also includes four core values. And when we articulated them in 2014, they were intellectual freedom, integrity, stewardship, and diversity. Uh, as I hope to show you, uh, AU Presses devotes a good bit of energy to identifying principles and best practices uh, that guide our own and our members' proper and ethical interactions. So I now will devote the balance of my talk to exploring uh, each of these four core values uh, in some detail and in a specific, uh, a specific format. Our four core values were first identified in 2014, um, and they existed just as uh, four bullet points and four words uh, in a document. And over the intervening years, we realized that in fact, uh, 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 we needed to define what we meant by these uh, very broad terms. So in 2019, our board went through a, uh, a, a, a deeply thoughtful uh, exercise uh, in uh, uh, defining the four core values. They carved time out of a board meeting to do group work and to report out. They set about uh, iteratively writing down and, uh, uh, and collaborating on agreed definitions for those four values. Uh, and uh, when their work was done, our designer, uh, took that all in, imagined co-equal interrelated values. Uh, so she chose a circular form to represent them that's uh, intended to invoke, uh, uh, or intended to evoke a compass. And I think that's probably an important metaphor. And we launched this at our most recent annual meeting, I think to some success and, and broad community buy-in. 
uh, one more uh, quick note. You might have seen that in 2014, uh, the goal was diverse or the core value was diversity. Uh, but in 2019, uh, the goal, the, sorry, the core value be, has become diversity and inclusion. And I think if you reflect on that for just a minute, you can see that uh, it's indicative uh, of the evolution uh, in the way uh, many communities of practice, uh, uh, many members of society uh, think about diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, in 2019 and 2020 versus in 2014. I think it's an important uh, and positive development. So uh, now I'll just unpack each of these a little bit. Uh, because of the conference theme, I'll try to do that uh, by making special note of how diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, influences the shape of each of our core values. So first and foremost, uh, intellectual freedom. Uh, we promote the free exchange of ideas, the unfettered pursuit of scholarly inquiry, the emergence and evaluation of new theories, and the expansion of human knowledge. We champion the freedom to think, research, publish, and read as pillars of an open and just society. So the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion considerations that uh, enrich this core value um, are we being inclusive in the exchange of ideas and the pursuit of knowledge? Uh, are we being inclusive in evaluating new ideas? Are we engaging the full spectrum of humanity and human experience when we say we're expanding knowledge? expanding human knowledge. So the important thing I think here is that when we talk about intellectual freedom as a core value and how we defend it, uh, uh, we have to interrogate and reinterrogate who's the we uh, and make sure that the, uh, uh, the we is as inclusive uh, as possible. So some examples of the ethical actions that we've undertaken uh, uh, in, in reference to this particular core value. Uh, university presses, as everybody probably knows, uh, publish in a wide uh, range of scholarly disciplines, although specifically primarily in the humanities. So um, we engage in uh, advocacy on behalf of humanities work, uh, both uh, in the public sphere and within our institutions where it, it has to be credited, uh, the value of the humanities seems to be coming, seems to be becoming less and less clear. <clears throat> we promote new areas of study, cultivate new disciplines. Uh, I think historically it, uh, it, it's, it's reasonably regarded that uh, university presses uh, uh, through the cultivation of lists were pivotal in the 60s and 70s and the establishment of disciplines such as gender studies, queer studies and critical race theory. But that kind of cultivation work continues to this day. So, uh, for example, Oregon State University and a number of other presses uh, are doing pioneering work and publishing in the area uh, of indigenous studies. Uh, our colleagues at MIT Press are publishing uh, at the intersection of science, technology, art, and design. Um, yeah, so the, the work there continues. We, uh, uh, we see ourselves as champions of new and underrepresented voices. And in fact, a, a good example of that is that at um, uh, this year's University Press Week, which I think starts uh, on Monday the 9th of November, uh, our theme will be hashtag raise up. Uh, and it's the, the activities that are planned for the week are all intended to raise and elevate uh, new and underrepresented voices. Um, I've highlighted on this slide the association's statement on open access, revised statement on open access. Not so much for the merits uh, uh, of the statement, although it's an excellent statement, uh, but I think because uh, you know open access, the, it, there are a variety uh, of opinions on open access and a variety of approaches to open access and uh, many, many experiments going on. Uh, and the statement, I think, uh, reflects uh, our community's ability uh, and desire to balance uh, the needs of multiple constituencies. So it's a good example of uh, that kind of work. And then probably finally and most importantly, and alas, with increasing frequency uh, in recent weeks and months, uh, we uh, have found ourselves in a position of having to uh, articulate uh, a number of times in public statements uh, the essentiality of intellectual freedom. 
uh, not just against uh, uh, the onslaught from uh, the federal government, but also sometimes from private actors, uh, like when Zoom um, uh, banned an important conference that was occurring out at uh, San Francisco State University. Um, so those are just some of the examples of the ways that we work to promote our value of intellectual freedom. The second of our four core values uh, is integrity. And when we say integrity, we mean uh, conducting our work ethically and honestly, earning and sustaining the trust of our authors, our readers, and our home institutions, and establishing best practices in peer review to ensure rigor and reliability in the scholarly record. So some of the diversity, equity, and inclusion considerations that inform this core value uh, we have to ask ourselves, are we being honest by including awareness uh, and acknowledging uh, underlying uh, privilege uh, and inherent bias? Uh, are we earning and re-earning our, our colleagues' trust through self-aware and transparent processes? Are we evaluating best practices for bias, uh, sharing widely and vetting those within the, and across the broadest reaches uh, of our global community? Just a few quick uh, examples of the uh, ethical actions uh, some that we've recently undertaken uh, to support and promote our, uh, our core value of integrity. Uh, we make available public resources, uh, such as our best practices for peer review, and a comprehensive uh, FAQ guide to helping authors uh, and others uh, understand the tricky world of clearing permissions for the scholarship they hope to publish. Uh, we make available member resources that promote uh, integrity, such as uh, uh, our marketing handbook and our business handbook. Uh, and then we also make avail available membership collaboration tools uh, that allow ongoing interrogation of integrity. We conduct hangouts, we conduct webinars, we maintain pretty robust lists, and we've recently launched a, uh, a service called UP Commons, which is kind of what the name sounds like. It's a virtual space where uh, communities of interest uh, can gather and uh, 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 share ideas, share problems, collaborate, share documents. Um, and uh, we fully launched UP Commons uh, in probably June. Uh, and we're actually up to probably about 40 groups or communities of interest and over 900 users. So still early days for UP Commons, but it's a collaboration tool that really is serving the community well. The third of our four core values is stewardship. And stewardship means investing resources mindfully in the development and dissemination of scholarship, respecting the fundamental labor of publishing, and being conscious of our responsibilities as global citizens. It also means amplifying authors' voices and working to advance and preserve an inclusive scholarly record. So what are some of the DEI considerations that uh, inform our approach to this core value? Uh, we ask ourselves, are we valuing and investing in a wide range of authors? Again, interrogating our actions for implicit bias. Uh, are we evaluating and investing in staff as a resource? And that is taking seriously valuing the labor of publishing. And then we ask ourselves, are we being conscious of the impact on the environment and global resources uh, of the work we do? And just a few quick examples there. Uh, our design and production folks have for years um, uh, uh, strived, strove, striven, strived to make smart environmental choices. Uh, and in fact, recently, uh, some of you may be aware that the United Nations uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goals folks uh, released a publisher's compact. And we'll spend the next several months socializing that compact and uh, encouraging our members uh, to evaluate uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals and make good choices there. Uh, we serve as stewards of authors' ideas at all points in the publishing process. Uh, I think that uh, the comparatively extensive developmental editorial work that university presses do, especially with new authors, uh, is an excellent example of that. Uh, we also seek to be good stewards of our parents' institutional investment. Um, and there's a lot of ways to think about this, right? Most university presses receive an institutional budget allocation. Uh, are we responsible with how we um, 
uh, with how we use those resources. But I wanted to share with you a particularly instructive, I thought, uh, approach to uh, uh, stewards, financial stewardship uh, in the form of an article. Uh, the link is uh, in my slide. It was uh, published uh, in, of all places, University Business Magazine. Uh, and Darren Pratt, the director of the press at the University of Colorado, uh, tr makes the point that, uh, that when you do the math, university presses actually take that institutional budget allocation and through the work that they do, generate a five times return on investment for their parent institutions. It's a unique, uh, novel, and I think uh, kind of essential way to look uh, at the way university presses uh, perform for their parent institutions. And of course, as an association, we're good stewards of staff potential. We have robust professional development programs for all of our members, including an amazing annual meeting, we offer residency programs. We compile on a biennial basis uh, compensation statistics so that uh, managers can benchmark and so that staff can be aware. Uh, so to, just to put some context on stewardship, Alison Muddit, when she was the director uh, of the Cal University of California Press, she's now, at, uh, uh, she's now the CEO of PLOS, said commercial publishers produce books to make money and university presses make money to publish books. So our final, uh, our final core value is diversity and inclusion. Uh, why in 2020 does that need to be a separate core value, uh, especially if we've already attempted to make the case uh, that diversity, equity, and inclusion need to inform all our actions as a community? Uh, and, and quite simply, the answer to that is to keep the focus uh, where it needs to be until our, uh, our tactics and our goals are more fully developed and widely integrated and, frankly, realized. Uh, you'll recall earlier I used the infrastructure example to talk about how a strategic plan is a living document and how we sunsetted uh, infrastructure as a goal when we felt we had uh, increased our uh, uh, what software developers like to call capability maturity in the area. So uh, we look forward to the day as a community. Uh, we're actively engaged in working towards the day when diversity and inclusion no longer needs to be a separate core value. So let me just briefly, I see that I'm a little tight on time here. Let me just briefly touch on some uh, of the actions we've undertaken as a community uh, uh, to advance our core value of diversity and inclusion. A couple of years ago, our board established two task forces, one on diversity and inclusion, and one on gender equity and committees of respect. Both of those, report, both of those committees reported back, the task forces reported back to our board uh, and one of the many recommendations and outputs of that process was the establishment of a permanent equity, justice, and inclusion committee. Uh, and if you're curious about the work that the equity, justice, and inclusion committee has been up to recently, uh, uh, there is buried on our website uh, under news on page three, link to a, an article that was published in May of this year in a magazine called UKSG Insights that provides a, an outstanding overview of some of the actions that we've undertaken already. Uh, we work to visibly educate uh, and uh, make recommendations uh, to our volunteer leaders. So you'll see that we released a fairly comprehensive uh, and, and I think um, a well received uh, statement on equity and anti racism earlier this year. We've conducted community reads to interrogate uh, uh, books that touch on is issues of anti racism. Uh, we are attempting to foster more inclusive recruitment efforts for entry level staff. I think the uh, Mellon Diversities Program, Diversity Fellows Program, which is now in its fifth year, is a good example of that. Uh, we also recently, a very uh, micro level tactic, uh, we recently adopted a policy for our own jobs board, which is a, an essential tool for uh, recruiting and obtaining. Um, uh, positions within the university press community. We had recently adopted a policy that uh, unpaid internships could no longer be posted on our jobs board. Uh, you'll hear more about the uh, Coalition for Diversity uh, and Inclusion in Scholarly Publishing tomorrow, I think when Pooja shares a panel on um, C4 Disks uh, uh, toolkit for allies. Uh, but uh, AU Press has uh, served as a co-founding member of C4 Disk. Uh, we've revised our own code of conduct to make sure that all of our uh, meetings and spa the spaces we create are safe and welcoming for every member of our community. Uh, we've created a toolkit to uh, 
help uh, our individual member presses adopt their own codes of conduct. And you can see great examples of that uh, on the websites for the presses at the University of Georgia uh, and at Princeton. Uh, so finally, just a, a few quick concluding thoughts uh, distilled from our early experiences uh, with working with uh, our core values and trying to implement them through a lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think at a macro level, it's probably important to uh, keep in mind that it's helpful when a university presses imperatives and strategies amplify their parent institution's ethical imperatives uh, and, and also at the same time work to support and advance the global knowledge ecosystem. Uh, and then I think discerning and supporting specific ethical imperatives requires deliberate attention and review. Again, owning privilege and acknowledging bias. Community engagement in defining and redefining what these core values mean. And probably most importantly, uh, maintaining a sense of flexibility when working with specific tactics. Uh, and I think how we uh, uh, evolved diversity into diversity, equity, and inclusion, or, or equity, justice, and inclusion in our own community can serve as a useful example of that. So with that, I'll say thanks. Look forward to unpacking this a little bit more when we get to the Q&A discussion. And uh, uh, turn the talking stick over to Barbara Klein-Pope. Barbara. Barbara, your audio is muted. I'm sorry about that, John. I thought that um, it was over an overarching mute and that it would become unmuted um, originally. But so I'm going to start all over again, OK? that work? All right. So um, thanks so much for spending time today to talk about um, building a culture of dignity at Johns Hopkins University Press. I also want to thank Peter for his leadership uh, at AU Presses. And, and it's a real privilege to be uh, a member of AU Presses and to see uh, what kinds of um, things are happening there as far as values go and really defining those values. And so uh, it's really encouraging. So I'm gonna take some of Peter's concepts, uh, which are at the industry level and bring those down to the press level. And so to, to begin, I really want to um, tell you a bit about Johns Hopkins University Press. We have 130 people working together across four divisions. We want to run one of the largest journals programs in the US with nearly 100 journals in the humanities and social sciences. Hopkins Fulfillment Services helps other university presses achieve scale through handling their book distribution. Our books division publishes about 140 books a year across the humanities, sciences, health, and public health. And at Project Muse, we aggregate about 70,000 eBooks and 700 journals across the humanities and social sciences from hundreds of publishers. And that really allows all of that content to be discovered and used around the world. John asked that I talk about the work we've been doing around our uh, workplace culture and the concept of dignity that undergirds that work. But first, um, I think we really need to look at culture in context. And our work to recognize our culture to build a vision for what we want that culture to be, and then build those action steps and those initiatives that will allow us to get to that future culture is important. And I'll share that work in detail soon. But I think it's important to realize that having a healthy workplace culture is necessary to reach an even higher goal. 
And that higher goal is really a workplace of equity, justice, and inclusion, which I'll refer to going forward as uh, just as EJI um, as a shortcut. So even though we're still in the culture phase of our work, we've mapped out our strategy objectives um, around EJI. And so my talk today will we'll really look at these three parts and I'll ta tackle them really from the top down. So none of us are experts in um, EJI at the press. So once we thought we reached a, a good point in our overall strategic plan that includes EJI, we reached out to our new chief diversity officer, Katrina Caldwell. And I have to tell you, I've never learned so much in a 30 minute conversation than I did from her. She reviewed our strategic plan. Um, and as she did that, she really emphasized what we all know generally, and that is language is incredibly important. And her advice uh, took the wording in this plan really from talking about equal access to wording that really drives toward equal outcomes. And I'm sure that um, as we go through this conference in the next three days, you'll probably hear quite a bit about those differences. Equal access, as we know, doesn't typically ensure true equity and justice. So it's an, it was an incredibly important conversation that I had with her. And based on that conversation, this plan really went from EJI being uh, a value um, and also one of our five objectives. And Peter talked about, you know, why does diversity and inclusion really need to, to still be in those, the, you know, a top strategic place or a value. And um, so I'm glad that he explained why that's important and I agree with him. But she also made sure that, that we made sure that the um, EJI was was woven across all of the initiatives within um, the strategic plan. You, you don't see the initiatives actually written out here. Um, there, are, there are many, many, many of them. The type gets quite small. And we also believe that the initiatives for us to reach these goals are sort of proprietary. And so I'm not showing them here. But I wanna verbally share with you a few of the initiatives that appear um, actually in these boxes. They include anti-racism training and education. And we're really looking to our chief diversity officer to help us with that. We're also looking uh, to the Association of the University Presses to give us a leg up um, to help us make sure that all of our staff get that kind of training. We also wanna give voice to underrepresented groups um, across all of our content and service offerings. And Peter also mentioned that. We also plan to identify systemic barriers for underrepresented groups and proactively dismantle them. So in addition, you know, our vision is now outcome oriented. When I took, before I talked with Katrina, we referred to equal access to knowledge. Now our vision is we envision a future where knowledge enriches the lives of every person. And so thanks to Katrina and others, this plan we believe is now EJI forward. To add to our learning, um, I shared this revised uh, plan with our advisory board. One of our advisors is Earl Lewis, and he pointed me to the image he uses in, a, in his classes now at the University of Michigan. You probably remember him uh, most as uh, the head of the Mellon Foundation, but he's back at Michigan running this, the Center for Social Solutions. And I know that this image is much used, uh, so most of you probably have seen it before. And my reading in the last um, couple months about this, I also know that it's, it's also somewhat criticized. But I think it's a useful tool for those of us who are working hard to really better understand the differences between equality, equity, and justice. And so we're using that at our press. So in sum about each, our EJI work, um, just wanna make a couple of points. Um, and, and this goes to what Peter said. It's, it's still imperative that a top level strategic objective be centered on EJI. We need to make sure that that um, arises to the same level of importance as our other strategies, but that EJI should also be woven into all of our work. I also, um, you, you won't be surprised, um, implore you to reach out to your own chief diversity officer in your university for help or, or in your own institution for, for help in um, implementing those initiatives around EJI. And finally, um, 
I so employer employ you uh, to learn as much as you can about EJI. So now on to the review of the work that we've done around culture. So when I got to Hawkins three years ago, two of the things that I witnessed was the amazing level of skills and knowledge among the staff and across the board commitment to our mission. And Hopkins is a mighty and successful press and has been for a really long time. And as far as university presses go, it's um, relatively large and complex. So early on, I made sure to talk to as many people as possible um, and to continue to attend meetings across the press um, in all divisions to listen to concerns. And um, what I really found was that we could improve on how people interacted, how they collaborated and understood the mission of the press and their own role in that mission. So in short, I realized that we needed to chart the future of our culture before we could chart the future of our press. And with me being new, uh, it seemed the perfect time to launch a full workplace culture planning. And I don't have time, and it wouldn't be appropriate for me to share all of the detail around the results of that work. Instead, I'm gonna share with you the process that we went through as a press of 130 people um, so that it might serve as a framework for you to work on your own workplace culture. So to do this properly, you start with an assessment of your culture. Where are you now? Putting, putting, putting the, that down in words on paper and getting an agreement really among all staff is essential. You then build a vision for the culture that you want. Then you conduct a gap analysis that brings out the initiatives that you need to get to that current, from that current culture to your future culture, what, what your aspiration is for your culture. And then of course you implement it and measure what you've accomplished. And so that process sounds easy enough. Um, it's exactly how to get this work done that is and has been incredibly hard. We started out by hiring Lynn Lato Flayhart. She's an amazing organizational behavior consultant to help us map out the specifics and together to take us through all of these stages. And I've worked with Lynn many times over the course of my very long career and know that her philosophy really meshes with mine. And we set out to make sure that uh, this work included transparency and participation by all staff. And we know that, that those two things are really imperative uh, when leading change. And so a major um, criterion for every step was to include maximum participation by staff members. For example, in the assessment stage of our culture, we had more than 100 people involved. And in mapping our future, we had groups uh, that of that, uh, 40 people who participated in workshops, and we communicated to all staff every step of the way. Lynn started with a definition of, of organizational culture and, and the reasons why it's important to measure it. And we made sure that staff uh, understood why we were undergoing um, this kind of assessment and what we wanted to get out at the end. So we conducted an all staff survey that yielded an 88% response rate from our 130 people. Lynn also conducted an in-depth interview, um, many in-depth interviews with people we identified as particularly important to this process, but we also opened it up to anybody who wanted to participate. We wanted to be incredibly inclusive. But as we were assessing uh, how to decide on our future culture, we realized that we needed a framework in order to ground our work and, and to really determine where we currently were and where we wanted to go. And so we settled on this framework. This is a framework by Groisberg, Lee, Price, and Chang, and it was published in Harvard Business Review um, in, in uh, 2018. One of the reasons I like this framework is because of the definitions of these eight attributes of culture. Those definitions, and I, I'm not gonna go through all the de definitions now, but those are, those are in that paper in HBR, and they are all positive. So for example, there's no stigma to being an organization that either is or aspires to be uh, based on authority. 
there are reasons why an organization needs to be based on authority to be successful. And every organization has some aspects of each of these uh, eight uh, types of company culture. And our goal was really to determine where we were weighted the heaviest and where we wanted to be weighted heavier in the future. We had four workshops of 10 people each. They represented each division and they were at various levels and they worked to determine our current state. And one representative from each of those workshops came together uh, to provide a synthesis of that work and to communicate that work out to all staff. And here I am gonna go ahead and share with you some top level results. We determined that we lean heavily toward purpose, order, and safety. We didn't want to completely give up those aspects of our culture, but we wanted them to be weighted less heavily. So again, through inclusive workshops, we determined that we wanted a culture that was more um, centered on learning, caring, and enjoyment. The enjoyment piece, um, we actually uh, translated that into job fulfillment to make it sound a little less like we just all wanted to have more fun. Um, so what we did after that is uh, a gap analysis. And in that gap analysis work, we used this format to list the specific aspects of our current culture, the specific aspects of our aspirational culture. And these were categorized under, under those three um, learning, caring, and fulfillment categories. We defined the gaps, and then we built action items to get us to our future culture. We're still working on this. Um, as I like to say, uh, the, the work that we're talking about today is never done. Um, it, we need to keep working at it. It's similar to uh, communication. You know, there's never enough communication. But I want to transition now to this third area of dignity, and you'll notice um, on this slide that there's a mapping, a mapping of each of these principles uh, to dignity principles. And that takes us to um, our discussion on dignity. About halfway through the culture work, I read Donna Hicks' book, Leading with Dignity. It's published by Yale University Press. And I was so inspired by this book and so inspired by her work because its principles um, undergird all that we are trying to do with our culture. We decided to adopt it as the foundation of our culture work. And while I don't have time to give this book um, justice, know that it emphasizes that we are all born with inherent dignity and that no one can take that away. So in the book, Donna talks eloquently about her early work in conflict res resolution um, in Northern Ireland. And she was doing that work with Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Donna, it, this is in the book, Donna said to him that so many people had told her that the other side in this Northern Ireland work had stripped them of their dignity and that their fight was about regaining their lost dignity. And here's what Desmond Tutu, Tutu said back to her. What are you talking about? No one has the power to strip us of our dignity. How do you think we got through apartheid? knowing that our dignity was in our hands and in our hands only sustained us in those darkest moments. And this insight became one of the building blocks of Donna's dignity model. Donna Hicks explains the ways uh, in which we can all honor each other's dignity and the, tempta the temptations that we have to violate each other's dignity. And so for us at, at Hopkins, having this kind of common language to talk about our daily interactions is extremely helpful in preventing and resolving conflict. And in particular, resolving that conflict at the level of the people involved. It helps to hold ourselves uh, accountable in ways that's useful to the work that we share and, um, and the work we collaborate on. It allows us to understand how we can best accept other people's identity and it puts an emphasis on fairness and other important concepts to our staff. We invited Donna Hicks uh, for an all staff meeting at the press and Peter Berkery joined us there as well. And uh, she's conducted dignity education for us, but we still have quite a bit of work to do to take advantage of all of that her work has to offer. But dignity is undergirding our workplace culture and our workplace culture is undergirding our 
equity, justice, and inclusion work. So as you might expect, uh, I encourage you to read this book um, and our entire staff have done so. I wanna make a note again about how important language is. And I was discussing this presentation with a colleague at Hopkins um, who's well-versed in our work in dignity and culture. Um, and he had also just read the president's uh, recent executive order on combating race and sex stereotyping. My colleague suggested that I not mention our work around dignity um, during this, this uh, conference because of the way the president was using the word dignity. He said that my using it might send the wrong message. I had also read the executive order and that is, I discussed it with Peter Berkery um, and we talked about this issue and you know, what, what tax should I take um, in, this, in this presentation? And he suggested I call Donna Hicks, which I did. So it was a great idea. And I spoke to her last week and she hadn't seen the executive order before I pointed her to it. And she gave me permission to tell you that when she read it, she felt like she was going to vomit. So we had a really good conversation. In short, and if you haven't read it, the executive order makes clear that the president is working to co-opt the language around the inherent dignity of every person as an individual to argue that we do not need anti-racism training. So Donna and I talked for an hour. Um, of course, she agrees with the part of the executive order stating that dignity is inherent in all individuals. That's the heart of her work. But the use of that statement as a dichotomy to anti-racism training is a huge problem. We talked about the fact that historically speaking, we've not treated entire groups of people as if they had that inherent, inherent dignity. That we need to understand the historic trauma and suffering of those who have for so long had their dignity violated. We agree that dignity and equity, justice, and inclusion go hand in hand, and that we definitely need the training that the executive order is trying to take away. We need to understand each other's lived experiences, the experiences of those whose dignity has been assaulted. She continued to say that once we have those learnings, it cannot end there. We need to come back together for a more fruitful shared humanity. And so she and I decided that we would not allow the president to pull up the language of dignity for his unworthy purposes. We concluded that we cannot shy away from our work around dignity, around culture, and around equity, justice, and inclusion. So I hope that we can all realize that these concepts are companions. The most effective workplace culture with a foundation of honoring others' dignity is necessary, but not sufficient to right the injustices of the past and ensure that underrepresented groups have equal access, who, who, who do not just have equal access, but also enjoy equal outcomes. And our sights are set on equal outcomes and justice in the workplace. We're positive about that, but we have a lot of learning and a lot of work to do to reach that goal. Thank you. I'll turn it over to John. Thank you so much, Margo. Uh, we, um, we have a few minutes for questions uh, from the audience. And we do have one question already from the audience uh, from Richard Brown. Hello, Richard. Uh, can you elaborate, Barbara, on the cultural shift from access to outcomes? And what specific impact has that had on what you publish and how you publish? So that shift um, happened in, in our strategic planning. And we're still working on our strategic planning. It's not quite finished yet. And so rather than setting our sights on just equal access, which we understand um, it does not necessarily lead to equal outcomes, <laughs> we are looking to those equal outcomes. And so um, we will be having initiatives that allow us to um, make sure in all of our content that we are publishing broader audiences or publishing for broader audiences and also for broader authors. Um, in our work and make sure that those outcomes occur. We're gonna have measurements in our uh, strategic plan 
to make sure that we see the outcome of that rather than just allowing equal access. And uh, I would like to remind attendees that you can put the questions in the Q&A and we will field them as they come in. Um, and uh, I do want to thank uh, both Barbara and Peter for speaking today. I, I thought it was very important to hear from both of you. Um, and I myself have been a member of AU Presses for almost all my career. And Barbara, I think you were one of the earliest people I met in my career. Um, so it's great to have you both here. Uh, so another question from the audience. Um, Barbara, what, uh, what were some of the other books that you um, read as a company in this process? Um, this, is, this is the only book so far that, that we have bought and purchased from Yale University Press and distributed across, across the press at this point. I would love to have some recommendations. Um, I know that there are two books that um, are being read um, by AU Presses. Uh, I think it was for the last uh, annual meeting. There was um, White Fragility and one other book, I think, by Temple University Press. And so as we go through our work and we realize the kinds of things that we need to learn, I'm sure that we'll be picking up some of those other books. And Peter might know the title of the one from Temple. I can't remember. Invisible People. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and actually, both I, I loved both of those books. Invisible People was so powerful because it actually it actually exists at the intersection of uh, uh, dignity and uh, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so it, it's a wonderful, wonderful anthology. I'd commend it to anybody. I, I also think I, I know that in some circles this is controversial. I also think uh, Beacon Presses. Uh, they're also a member. Beacon Presses. Uh, uh, White fragility uh, remains um, uh, a strong introduction. Uh, for those of us who were born and raised and freighted with white fragility uh, to the challenges of thinking about the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion from an anti-racist perspective and, and from a perspective of seeking not equal access, but equal outcomes. Uh, right. So they were, both, they, they were both strong first choices, I think, for our Community Reads program. I'll also mention, I've been reading uh, Dr. Ibram X. Kendi's book, how to be an anti-racist, which is a, a great eye-opener. Uh, so we have another question from the audience. Um, this isn't directed at, at e either of you, so either feel free to take it. How might staff encourage equity work when leaders aren't initiating it? That's a good question. <sighs> that, that's, well, that you know, is, that's a challenge. It can be a challenge, but I also think, you know, depending on who your leader is, your leader is listening and listening to concerns and listening to um, ideas across the press. You know, for example, um, for the strategic planning, like I said, you know, we just try to be so incredibly inclusive. We use this platform called Idea Scale in order to collect ideas about all parts of the strategic plan. What, what the, we wanted to get more initiatives into that strategic plan. And so it was a way for people to identify themselves and say the kinds of things that um, they wanted to say about initiatives, but they could also do it anonymously. And we did get quite a few, you know, I'm already, you know, working to be EJI forward, um, but we got a lot of ideas about how not only to build the initiatives, but then on the tactics level, how to make sure that that happens. And so it's, you know, there are different ways that, that presses and organizations and institutions can really um, be inclusive in, in the input that they get and into the leaders and then the management level that, that they get. So it's, um, I, think, I think you need to say, say what you want, want to happen in your organization if you find it safe. You know, and I will say, you know, Peter was sort of saying, wow, it could be tough. Yeah, if it's not a safe place, it could be tough. Right. Yeah. Right. I, 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 what, one possibility, and this is not a, a good answer, and it's not a complete answer, but it, it's an incremental step. Uh, I think it's sort of our hope uh, as an organization uh, that uh, uh, 
elevated awareness and, if you will, frankly, peer pressure will bring some folks uh, further along on the journey um, than they may be right now. And a good example of that is um, our when our Equity, Justice and Inclusion Committee was the Diversity and Inclusion Task Force, one of the things that they observed uh, in their report and recommendations to our board uh, speaks exactly to the concern in this question, and that is how do we get leadership engaged on these issues? And so uh, obviously we we have no course of powers, we have carrots. Um, and uh, 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 so, so we will be offering uh, to all of our member press directors at no charge, uh, uh, anti-racism training in the third week in uh, November through a, a wonderful organization called the Racial Equity Institute. Um, and it is, it's my hope that through whatever combination of uh, powers of persuasion, uh, cajoling, enthusiasm, uh, that all 154 of our member press directors uh, will participate in this training. It is revelatory. It will help them see things in ways they may not have seen them heretofore. Um, and so I, I think if you're in a safe space, you can do it Barbara's way. Uh, and if you're in a not so safe space, you probably need to take the kind of oblique approaches uh, that we're going for here. Not a perfect answer, but it's kind of the best I could come up with. My answer to that earlier question would be time to get new leaders. Um, so we have another question from the audience. Uh, does equal outcomes require equal access or are they exclusive of each other? That's a really good question. My, my initial reaction, not as I said, I'm not, I'm not an expert in this, right? And, 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 and I did say, too, how much I learned in 30 minutes from Katrina Caldwell. Really looking forward to, to, the, to the training that, that Peter put forward. But my initial reaction is, yeah, I mean, if you don't have access, how can, how can you participate in whatever activity it is that, are going, that you're going to get to equal outcomes? That's, that's what I'm, how I'm looking at it right now. But um, I'm very process-oriented person, so I, I may be looking at that too simplistically, and I'll turn it to Peter to see if he has a deeper thought about it. Uh, not a deeper thought. I think, it's a, I think it's a tough question to answer without context, right? There could be contexts in which the answer is yes, and I could envision contexts in which the answer is no. And in candor, uh, it kind of depends on um, who's asking the question. Uh, and why they're asking it. So I don't know that, uh, I, I, while I like your answer, I don't know that there's a one size fits all. I think I would want to hear the facts and circumstances uh, before uh, uh, the bench issued a ruling. That's fair. Um, Barbara, you mentioned that you're a process person and, and I, I also <laughs> have um, really done a lot of work in process improvement and continuous improvement and do you, do you see this kind of work as, as a sort of form of continuous improvement or process improvement? Absolutely. And, and, you know, I mentioned very quickly that I felt that we needed to go through this process of, of um, assessing our culture and, and, and building a vision for our culture before we can build a vision for our press. And so, you know, we're still working on the culture part of it, but we're, we're, we're also, you know, looking to, you know, we, we are have almost finished our strategic planning, and so those initiatives are, are will be part of that you know kind of process improvement. Um, so yes, great. We have time for another question or two, um, uh, Barbara, and also and also Peter. You know, as you look at different organizations, how 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 will you define success in this? <sighs> Well, we have measures set out, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, I know that that whole part of part of the strategic plan was blank on the slides, um, but that whole the, it, it goes from, you know, the measures are supposed to measure your your progress toward the strategic objectives, and so we have a list of many many measures there, and it's going to have to start out. We're going to have to we're going to have to do some benchmarking, right? Yeah. You know, you can't measure something if you don't know where you're coming from. And so, um, 
you know, we need, we need to know um, what our author base looks like. You know, um, we have some indications of that, but we've not really benchmarked that. We need to know better what our readership is like in mm -hmm. order to be able to benchmark that we are providing equal outcomes for all stakeholders, you know, and, and because we're also a service organization, that includes our clients and all of our service offerings as well. So our stakeholders at, at Hopkins are, it, it, it's a long list of people and it's gonna have to start with some benchmarking um, and then, you know, measuring <clears throat> the difference between that benchmark and, and what has happened after we've instituted those initiatives. And we're right now at the priority stage you know, we've put down so many initiatives that we, we want across all five of those strategic objectives. And we, we have to prioritize those. Um, surprise somebody didn't ask how much all this is gonna cost. Um, <laughs> so we, we do need to set our priorities and make sure that we are meeting um, our objectives as, as we then pick off some more initiatives and start working on that. Yeah, I, I always tell our students about, uh, you know, in different contexts about having measurable goals and the concept of, of smart goals, um, which which are really powerful. And, you know, in order to meet your goals and objectives, they really have to be precise and measurable. Uh, we have another question from the audience. Uh, as publishers, how do you define the lines of acceptable, publishable, non-biased, non-discriminatory research to those who worry about restricting academic freedom? Whoa. That's yeah. <laughs> well, in four minutes. One thought that occurs to me, and this is not intended uh, uh, entirely as buck passing, is uh, I feel like, uh, I would have to toggle over to another screen, and I'm reluctant to do that without blowing up the entire technology infrastructure that's supporting this uh, webinar. But I feel like there's other programs on the agenda that are addressing this quite specifically. Um, and <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to A, steal their thunder, <laughs> or B, uh, re reveal myself to be a fraud in comparison. So, <laughs> so I, I feel like in the first instance, the, the correct answer is, is tune in tomorrow. <laughs> tune, yeah, tune in, tune, tune in in a couple minutes. Uh, well, I'm going to wrap this up because I have to get out of this one and into the next one. Um, but uh, Barbara and Peter, uh, thank you so much for speaking to us today, and I, I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for your time today. Take care. Well Bye. done. Bye. Everybody, a quick two-minute break, and we'll be back at 2.15.